Alrighty, have we given the YouTube enough time to catch up? It's taking just a minute. Okay. We should be live now. Okay. Um, well, this is a, the Joint Conference Committee on Senate File 130 dealing with charter schools. And um, we received your concurrence request. And um, as the Senate looks at it, we had a number of concerns, but I think that the primary one would be um, the purpose of this bill was to create a second authorizer for charter schools. And the Senate version authorized the State Lands and Investments Board or the SLIB to be that second authorizer, but still retaining the current process in place, which allows a school district to be the authorizer and those um, to be decisions if denied to be appealable to the State Board of Education. So in studying the amendments that um, were adopted on the House side, I think we, there were uh, more or less three to four issues that I think that um, we're willing to, to visit on. But one is um, discussing some limitations on the number of charter schools that would be authorized. In looking at the amendments you adopted, I think that you wanted a maximum of three schools. Um, the Senate has talked about, you know, maybe we could discuss incorporating a sunset period in the alternative. Um, the other discussion point is who that second authorizer might be. And um, I think we feel very strongly that an election will probably make it more difficult, if not impossible, to get a charter school off the ground. But we would love to have a conversation with you about potential authorizers, if not SLIB. Um, you know, some other options could be um, county commissioners. Um, and then the final issue that we'd love to explore some options with is the appeal process. I believe in um, current law, it's a school district is the authorizer and they make appeals to the state board, but we'd be willing to discuss um, making that perhaps the SLIB or the Office of Administrative Hearings and Appeals um, or where we could have some other variations of that. You know, we could have the State Board of Education look at applications and have the final authorizer be county commissioners. Um, and then we also wanted to just have a conversation too about the qualifications um, of PTSB. So those are some of the, the things that we're interested in discussing with all of you. Um, but I think the thing that we feel most strongly about is not having the election. So with that, um, Mr. Co-Chairman, yes. would you like to offer some comments? Yeah, so Madam Chairman, thank you. And you know, I think uh, we didn't feel like the State Loan and Investment Board was close enough to the people um, and really didn't have, uh, didn't have the knowledge other than the superintendent. So obviously what we chose to do was make the superintendent of public instruction the authorizer upon an election. And so there's two ways that that can happen. As you know, one is the more arduous, which is you, you go out and petition and get it done. And the other one is you bring an application and then the superintendent puts it out to an election. And I really don't see that. Uh, and, and then obviously the size of the district, of the charter school district can be small or big, but no bigger than a school district. So I guess I'm struggling to understand if you can't get a vote of the people, then why would we want, why would we want a charter school if we don't have a vote of the people to support that notion? I think some of our concerns. Mr. Chairman, um, would you mind turning on your microphone? Uh, I think some of our concern there is that uh, an election is a very expensive way to go. Uh, this is really an administrative issue with, within the executive branch. Um, and, you know, we're a Republican and not a, a plebiscitory democracy. So we didn't think we've we've used elections a lot on tax issues, and that that has worked well for us. But on making this kind of administrative decision, we think it's a, a super expensive way to go, uh, and b not something that is the primary focus of most people. So we wonder what kind of turnout you'll get and that sort of thing. Um, we think that that's, it just basically doesn't make any sense to do it that way. And if your objective is to get somebody closer to the people, um, what's wrong with the county commission? Uh, it, because all these districts are basically one county within one county. So you have counties with multiple districts but there you have a locally elected uh, body that is close to the people. So that would be an option that we could consider. 
so just uh, just thinking here right now, currently, it's by a, a vote of a, an elected body close to the people, a school board that's elected by the people. Um, so I really don't see anything wrong with the school board making that decision. I think it should be a much higher standard to create a charter school outside of the scope of a of what a, a school district would want. And so I'm not convinced that it should be the vote of of a you know of a county commission. But you know, let me uh, let me write down some options here. And you know, so one option would be on authorizer would be. County Commission, and and then you know my my fellow committee members can talk as well. So you know either one of you, go ahead. Yeah, I I think uh, what the previous representative said is pretty much spot on. I think that, you know, because of the close relationship between a, a charter school and the local school district, um, if that local school district doesn't authorize that, uh, it really, since it really is, gets pretty complicated after that. And so, uh, you know, I guess we can look at some other options, but uh, certainly that that is the, the best way to go and maybe, uh, the standard ought to be a little higher to try to create one above wow. and beyond that, the normal channels. I think, you know, our current law, I mean, it's probably nobody takes better care of charter schools than what we do now. I mean, it's incredible, the funding and the support. And, uh, you know, and most charter schools are, are for profit, you know, and Wyoming's chosen a different path. And, uh, and if they're not for profit, they're, there's a profit at the end of it. Yeah. And, and most of that's done, you know, through various means. That's why the 85% was initially proposed. And, uh, but I think let's talk about Wyoming charters. Um, you know, the average for half the charter schools, I think nationwide closed down in 10 years, but Wyoming's really had a real steadiness. You know, you look at the two in Albany and the one here, and I think really it's all the love that the local school board has really given them. And, uh, and I, I guess if, do we have the information on how many have actually been turned down? How many applications statewide do we get that, that, uh, that info? But anyway, I think, and then the, the sponsors here, and I'll just say this, and then he's, every one of those standing committee amendments, we ran by the prime sponsor. I mean, we weren't surprising anybody. And I think, so we were just trying to work the bill and we moved it forward. So thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, to respond to that, I don't think it's so much a question of how many have been have applied and not denied is the problem we're getting after. I think the, the climate and the statutes that we have are a disincentive for anyone to apply at all. And so, you know, I think that if we looked at who the authorizer is, that's why we wanted to provide an alternative and have a little bit of, um, maintaining the current system because we recognize that in some instances, school districts do nurture, provide that support, but this would give someone else a different choice if, if they didn't feel like they were getting that or, you know, just wanted to do a different path. Um, you know, but certainly that could be an option if, if we did maintain the school district as the authorizer, what about their appeal if denied instead of going to the um, State Board of Education? And I've been doing some research on this. Right now the standard is, um, a little unusual, it's the best interest of the pupil. But if you look nationwide at what that standards, how that's used and how that phraseology is implemented in other states, it's really on a student um, by student determination. So examples would be like in New Hampshire, Nevada, um, you know, should a student, student be allowed to withdraw from a school and placed in another? Is that in the best interest of the pupil? Or should a student be expelled? Is that in the best interest of the pupil? But we have it woven into our statutes as some sort of legal standard um, is it in the interest, interest of pupils? And so it goes from being a subjective standard to an objective one. And so we're an outlier in my view in that regard. So I think what people might find more assurances is if their application is appealable to a different entity that doesn't have a vested interest that's so education focused. And so on that point, we were thinking maybe perhaps the SLIB or um, the Office of Administrative Hearing and Appeals and just set a different standard rather than best interest of the pupils 
what's best for the community, some of these really undefined standards, which have been problematic in other states, to just make that more clear, like either an arbitrary or capricious standard, which is something that we use regularly within governmental entities. So if you were adamant about maintaining the school district as the authorizer, maybe just having a different appellate level of review, how would you feel about something like that? So, you know, personally, I, I, would, I would not want to take that decision away from somebody that understood education. So to me, going to a different appellate, whether that's a, you know, that's SLIB or somebody else, um, I just think it's the wrong path. And I think this should be hard. I think it should be hard to do. That's where we differ. Um, well, I, th I think it is hard. Like, <laughs> it's, it's very hard, Mr. Chairman. It's so hard that we really haven't been getting many. We've got just, just a handful, these two counties primarily. Uh, and we think that people are simply not applying because the school board is sufficiently dominated in so many places by the, the entrenched educational establishment that we think that is not producing adequate results. We think we need to start seeing some competition, which the uh, school people have not been in favor of. We think that will improve significantly the quality. Um, so the, with the experience we've had here and what we've seen in other states, we think it requires an objective outsider to make a final decision, whether it's at an appellate level or not. Uh, otherwise, many of the school districts just say no and never think about it. So uh, we very much think that you need somebody separate. And Mr. Chairman, along those lines, it says like in our statutes, 21.3.3.10, here's the standard. If the state board finds that the local board's decision was contrary to the best interests of the pupils, again, an undefined term, the best interests of school districts or the community, the state board shall remand such a decision to the district board. So I think that's the, the barrier is when you start talking about what's in the best interest of the school district, if the primary interest is preserving ADM, it, this, is an this is a really difficult hurdle. I mean, you, you say you want it to be difficult, it is. And I think that's why we don't see the applications. Um, and so that's along the lines. I mean, we appreciate that you were willing to maybe look at limiting it to three schools. I think our ask would be, you know, we're, we're willing to recognize that before we have this presumption that they're going to fail, why not create a separate authorizer, try out the process and put like a sunset date of four years and see if having a more um, favorable statutory uh, framework for allowing these applicants to apply and just see if we get more applicants. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Maybe we authorize some, maybe we don't, and get to know who what's out there. Instead, it's just, I think, a, no, we, we don't like, we don't want, don't come here. And so that's, I think, our ask is, you know, we're willing, if you wanted to look at a sunset of four years, we think that would be something reasonable to, you know, this is not charted, uncharted waters for other states, but it is for us, we recognize that. Mr. Chairman, uh, are there, do we have any numbers? I mean, we talk like, how many have actually applied and been turned down? Do we know that? I mean, Mr. Chairman, I, I think I said, I don't know. I think that that's that, not the concern we're hearing. It's that people don't apply. And we've Mr. heard anecdotal information I mean, about that. Anecdotally saying, but I think, I think you'll find that it's less than a half dozen statewide, maybe, maybe 10 in the last 10 years. And I think, but I think that would be some good information because I don't know, maybe I just never hear this from anybody please reform the charter schools because we're going to, and when this was first brought to my attention last fall was about, well, it's going to happen in Casper and Cheyenne. It's the only places it can't happen. And now it's kind of being, there's a little shift that, well, maybe it's, we save our small schools. I don't know any of that, but I guess my thing is I look at the ones we have that are, have stayed active for a long time and we've really supported them. And you look at our statutes and I just think, Wow, I mean, how? What more can we do? I mean, I, I just uh, so I think some of these anecdotal things about we're unfriendly, our results aren't good, we don't like competition. Those aren't true, and I don't. I think we got to be careful because there are people listening to us, and we say we don't have good results, 
And I just, uh, and I don't want to, but I think we got to be really careful what we say. But I would like to know well, for a fact, how many have applied and been turned down? So, so Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman oh, I'm sorry, Sen uh, Representative Harshman, were you finished? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, let's hear from the bill's prime sponsor, Senator Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'll, I'll answer part of those as best I can. And I look at it somewhat differently as far as competition. I look at it as options. And we've got students out there that want other choices. We've got parents that want other choices. As far as what we have in existing statute, I think it was clear. You saw national charter school people came in on this. They said Wyoming ranks, I believe, in the bottom 40. They're in the 40s in the way they rank for being friendly for charter schools. And, you know, when you create an unfriendly environment, you don't get applications. So I, I, I don't buy that, hey, we, we haven't turned people down. They haven't applied because the bar is so high that there's no way for them to succeed to get there. And that shows in the ones that are there. Those schools that were there, uh, a former president of the Senate that I know very well, you wouldn't have had the one in Laramie if he wouldn't have shepherded it through. He personally wrote the legislation and shoved the thing through pretty well. Uh, I, I think it's important that we create an environment that creates the opportunity for that choice that doesn't threaten the system we have. And I, I for one, am one that don't weigh in as far as that we're doing a good job. I th I'm proud. My kids came out of that system. I came out of it. Uh, it works. But regardless of anything that works, there's different ways to do different things. And that's merely what this is. It's another tool for our education system and they shouldn't be threatened by it. If you're doing your job good, you do it hand in hand. And, you know, I look at snowy range come down here and the kids are happy, the teachers are happy, it's working. And obviously it's not a major threat to the Laramie High School or they'd have done it a long time ago. It's a very specialized school that's there for special reasons. And all five or six we have in the state all have a little bit different approaches. They all work reasonably well. You know, they, they've got their problems. So do our K-12 schools now. But for me, the reason I brought this is people came to me. It wasn't me. I'm not an education guy. And uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, I came to you last fall back to not sandbagging anybody. I came to you last fall and said, look, I went to a deal and listened to charter schools, and I think it's a viable thing. And you're correct. I thought when I listened to it, that was for a certain charter school that's there. They're not for profit. They run phenomenal test scores. The kids are happy, and it works. Non-discriminatory, they run a good one. Whether it works or not in that level uh, in Wyoming to come, I can't tell you. But I did morph as I went through. This is absolutely, I live in a town that's got a high school of 40 kids. You yourself have repeatedly told me, we don't figure this school deal out. Your little schools are the ones who are going to get hit. I've heard that steady from the education community. But you know what? That is my community. That's me. It's where my grandkids go to school and it matters to me. And I personally think it is the tool that can make small schools survive because they cannot deliver all of the standards we've put on our bigger schools. They just don't have the ability to hire the staff and the teachers to do it. Charter schools, and I think they'll be done within the districts if we can get them where they're friendly with them, but they provide a whole different level of education in a different way. And to deny us that ability because a local board is unwilling and unflexible, I think is a travesty to the people of Wyoming. It, your local boards, no one wants to create competition. And I sit here looking at two educators and a good friend of mine. And we talk about being open and trying to embrace change in Wyoming. And this is a classic example. We're fighting change. And the interesting part is this. It, it's not going to be a runaway. Why not take a look and let's refine it as it goes along, but don't, don't load the bill up to the point that it's not workable. And, you know, I did go along. You're correct. Because if I didn't go along, the bill was dead. We wouldn't be sitting here today. If I'd have fought hard with you, 
I wouldn't be sitting here today because the bill wouldn't have made it. I thank you guys. You gave it an honest hearing and we went through it. You did what, what we all do. You amended it to where you thought it was better, more workable bill. In some areas, I agree. In many, not. Uh, you can't have the fox guard the hen house. They're just not going to open the door in most cases, and particularly in some of the districts that need it the worst. The local school boards are resistant to change. And I can tell you, we run a, a modified one once again in Hewlett. If you pick up some national news articles, you'll see that Hewlett has a community farm as part of their school. First one in Wyoming. It has a community farm. Our, our VOAG teacher, actually, they went and put land on and they, they raised 4-H animals and FFA steers, pigs, sheep, goats, next to the school as a part of it. And it's a modified type of a charter situation. And it, for some of those rural kids, that's why they're in school in Hewlett. And it matters. And that's what I'm asking you is to, as you negotiate through this, think really hard about the what ifs, if you actually give it a chance and an honest chance. We can be back here a year from now or two years from now. And if things are going awry, we've got the ability to shut things up or down. We run bills every year on it. I don't think you're gonna see a flood. You're correct, back to applications. I'd be shocked if you put a three or four year sunset on it, if one even gets their foot in the door. But we might have a local district because of this that goes, I can tell you, I'm gonna to go to mine and say, take a look at it. But under our existing charter schools, it doesn't work. They've gotta be have some flexibility. That's in part of those repealers. You've got to give them some flexibility other than a rigid set. And this, this set of rules is every bit as rigid as what we put on our K-12. And that's one of the things I think that everybody has a problem with is, well, our other schools have to jump through all these hoops. Why shouldn't the charter schools? Maybe we ought to look inward and look at our other ones as well and say, should we be providing some more flexibility? Uh, I, I just think th this bill has some common sense in it. And like I said, I, I applaud you guys for letting it get this far. It, it matters to me and it matters a lot. Uh, I, I think we can walk out of here today or uh, however, with something that's actually reasonably work, work through the interim and come back with another bill and, and do some final touches on it. But let's not shoot the horse before he gets out of the barn. Thank you. Okay. Let, let me see my perspective and in get involved in this. Uh, of course, I represent a large district. And I hear complaints, and I was embarrassed to read the in the recalibration report uh, the comments there that they they made in terms of the quality where we're not getting what we're paying for, uh, and that's very blunt in that report. Uh, what I look at it is that all the rest of this successful part of our economy has been built on competition and competition puts pressure on all of us to perform better. And I think that if we had a vibrant charter school possibility and not having local districts able to just sh shut them down and not, not have them at all, we'd have a competition that would improve not only from the charter schools themselves, but I think it would improve our K-12 system entirely uh, quite a bit. So that's, that's my support here. And I think to do that, we've got to have an ability for an authorizer that's outside the system to, to make a final decision, either a pellet or uh, as an original authorizer as, as we had in the bill as it came to you. But, we're quite flexible on how you want to structure it, but we think we need that. We think that's an excess, uh, an ex essential part of the system. Madam Chairman. Representative Summers. Thank you. Um, first of all, I don't think that the recalibration report and how you describe 
Um, how you describe our successes of our schools is completely accurate. In fact, they have the NAEP scores in there and how well we have done. And, uh, and I think we've been rated as high as sixth and best in the region. So I'm, I'm, that old argument gets tiring. Um, and, I, and I think it's a, a false argument. Um, as we get back to this, you know, do, privatizing education <clears throat> in America is not gonna make it better. It'll make the richer kids get better education, but it's not gonna help the poor kids. And, uh, and so I don't, I, I don't uh, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, we started out both our families, right? And uh, education clear back in the day when our grandparents or great grandparents were there was always a public education. And, uh, and so I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge fan of charter schools, period. Um, now, the authorizer, I don't know that we're going to come to an agreement. I would agree that we could go from three schools to five schools, for example. You know, you know, I think that's that's something I could consider. I don't know how, how my 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 fellow my fellow committee members think, but the authorizer, I don't I don't envision us changing that now. Now, remember, this is going to go into a study. And if during that study, we come up with a better, more thoughtful authorizer, you know, I think that's that's something. But. Um, you know, I, I think of the, the example that the good bringer of the bill had about a small community or a small community like uh, Representative Paxton's. If they wanted a charter school and they went to the vote of the people in that community, those people would support it. If it had legs in that community, they would support it and they would create one. And uh, but if you have if you just have a for-profit fly-by-night company come in and want to form a charter school, they need to make the case to the people in that community. And, uh, and I think, you know, your idea of a county commission is interesting, but they're not involved in education. Um, at least the people, I think, have a better voice. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not inclined to give up that authorizer piece. We can uh, talk about that, but the number of schools you know, I certainly think we could maybe go up a shade on that. Mr. Chairman, so um, I just want to be clear, like the, the limit on schools gets problematic unless you have, I think, a statewide off authorizer like the SLIB, because then how do you judge like Cheyenne gets one first, then Pinedale, then Jackson, then Rock Springs, now Sheridan can't, like it doesn't seem like a, a way to manage that. And what if you have two applications going at the same time? So that's where I get a little nervous about setting a certain number of schools, unless you do have a statewide authorizer like the SLIB. Um, so that's where I think if not a limit on the number of schools, then maybe a sunset period. Um, but the, the thing that I think is troubling and the hard part to work around is, you know, I think we're willing to concede that if you want to continue to have the school board be the authorizer, then it's really a question of how the appeals are handled. Um, what the beauty was about this bill and why I liked it so much was it gave um, a person who wanted to bring in a charter school an option. If they wanted to work with the district, get the support of the district, and also receive 100% ADM, they'd have that option available and preserve the status quo as it is, or go to the SLIB and have this different process, but with a redu reduced ADM, 85%. So we would see what people would pick. If we go down this path, which I think we are open to doing, of maintaining it as the school district authorizer, I mean, you've just limited one option. And so really then it becomes a question of how you appeal it. And so I just wanna throw that out there that it wouldn't make sense to have two different appellate tracks. I think you just pick one. And then that changes the status quo of what's currently available for someone who wants to apply that you very much like. And so, and you said it yourself, you know, I'm not a fan of charter schools, period. That's, that's the hard part is I think some of us wanna give it a try and wanna see what's out there and understand what our kids are missing out on. So I am happy to talk about the, the limit on schools, three to five, but I think that would make sense if we maintained maybe these two separate checks and having the SLIB as the authorizer. Thoughts? Representative Paxton. Representative Paxton. Madam Chairman, you know, I'm not opposed to looking at, at some alternatives for, for an entry of a charter school. 
but what I what I do believe is that if if we do that, then we have to hold them to the same kind of standards that we're holding our public schools to. If we're spending public money on that, we can't have teachers that are not certified by the but by the uh, uh, STB uh, state, yeah, teachers. <laughs> but so, and I think that was part of what we saw in this thing too, is that they're not uh, uh, certified by PTSB. And I think that's part of it. We need to have those people, they, they have to have be held to the very same, same standards as the, as the uh, public schools are right now. So I'm not, a, I'm not totally opposed to looking at some alternative and I don't know what the best one is. You know, I, I'm probably a little more in favor of, a, of the study first and then, and then stepping into it. But, uh, you know, I, I see some potential for it. I don't have any resistance to that. For sure, we need some kind of a, an option. If the local school district turns you down, then, then there ought to be a, a, a someone else you can go to without, that shouldn't be too complicated, you know. Mr. Pack, or Chair, or, uh, Chairman Paxson, yes. If, you, if we go down this path of still allowing a SLIB separate authorization track, I think that's something that the, the Senate could come around to is the PTSB oversight. I think that's something that we would advocate very hard if that gives you and alleviates some of your heartburn with having at least two separate authorizers. Mr. Representative Harsh. I think the SLIB, I think is, I think we gotta be careful. I mean, first of all, we're, Supreme Court said we're in, you know, in charge in, uh, of education in the state. It's the legislator's duty to make sure it's thorough and efficient adequate and I think as a creation of the legislature I don't think the slib is the I got enough on their plate and this isn't one of their deals so I mean um, so that's why we didn't go with it I mean whether it's the state board or the superintendent if you want a second authorizer but to put it on the treasurer and the auditor and have those folks we got them doing other stuff on state loan investment board you know in the state so I just yeah I think that was something we had trouble with. And I just, you know, we created the State Board of Education. Uh, maybe that's a, a place for us, but I just, uh, I don't know. I think that's problematic. I'd... You know, and just to... hold on. Um, okay, so, Mr. Chairman, just to respond to that. So, in our conversations in drafting the bill, we picked the SLIB because they are elected officials. <laughs> And I, I do always find that this curious notion of who's closest to the people. I mean, they they are, visit every community they're elected. Um, but, you know, I think if you limit the number of schools, like how much work are we really adding to their plate? And we put a provision in there that says they have to check all the boxes for accreditation as required by the Wyoming Department of Education before it even gets to the SLIB. And so I think, you know, as, as someone, you know, we just worked on that gaming bill and you know we're trying to clear, create a clear process for someone to get their gaming license. And it's a check, check, check. Did you check all the boxes? You got your license. Um, I think that's what we're trying to get to a little bit, with a little bit more ease and certainty rather than the subjectivity of each local district. But um, Chairman Scott, did you want to comment? Well, if you don't like the slip board, uh, how about going either with the county commission because they are outside the educational establishment or going with a system of, of an appeal um, through the uh, Office of Administrative Hearings advising the state superintendent uh, with the issue, has the local board been arbitrary and capricious? That's, that's a, those are two different ways to, to, to do it. Are you interested in either of those? You know, until we study this in the interim, I personally don't wanna open this gate. So if you wanna, I think it's a fairly high bar that we created and uh, I wanna see that in place until it's been studied. And if we open the gate now, then the study's meaningless. We've already let, it, let, the, let the cow out. And so uh, I think it makes more sense to study this over an interim. We've, these things are not what you would call new they've been around the united states for a long time there's lots of experience frankly i don't see i think the study is an attempt to just not do anything um i think i think the we need to get moving on reform in our our school system 
we need the benefits of competition because that's worked so well from all the rest of our society. Um, let's stop being around the bush and actually do something. I think, Mr. Chairman, though, I, and Senator Scott, with all due respect, I think, you know, the last time that I remember really working on charter schools, it's been over 10 years ago. And I think you were in probably chair in health labor. Yeah. Labor yeah, health at that point. time. And I think it's probably good to refresh everybody because I don't think any of us actually know what's all in the statutes. And I think, but I think this reform piece, I think we got to, again, I think we got to be careful and we keep talking about Wyoming as an outlier uh, as, you know, we have fewer students statewide than Denver public schools, right? Or, and I think it's important to understand the diseconomies. You know, the little tiny schools are kept alive by small school adjustments, by fully funding the block grant. That's how they're kept alive. No other state does that like us. Because you know, and I know, Chairman Scott, we close four schools in our district. That's how we save money, close four schools. And so I think we just got to be really careful when we, because uh, we've got the highest graduation rate in the country. If we're not one or two, uh, our ACT scores are the 15 states that all take all kids take the ACT. We're in the top third of that, and just a smidge out of the top two or three. Uh, our NAEP scores are the best in the West, some of the best in the world. And I think we, uh, so it's important we, we spent a lot of time, you know, Hank Cole, Jeff Wasserberger, and countless others, when they chaired the education committee, we've built an incredible system. And we've picked up about 8,000 more customers. And, uh, and now we, I think we got to be careful of this narrative and make sure we're, you know, that little bit about what these recalibration guys said. Remember, they got hired because they said we double our performance. We followed their model. And you might recall that was 20 years ago. And uh, maybe they overpromised a little bit. No schools double, no schools anywhere have doubled their performance. Uh, we, we have so we've since, done really well. So, Madam Chairman, we have since the Campbell decisions improved just a smidge as you, you look at it. Um, we have the consultants saying that we're not getting our money's worth. Um, we have our consultants saying that we're having way too many students who do not re meet proficiency and that we will be unable to provide the kind of workforce that Wyoming needs going forward. Um, which, which we need, we need to, Sorry. that's, that's the recalibration consultants okay. by Cus and Odin. You read that, that, that report is very instructive. Everybody ought to read it. We need to improve and not rest in our laurels because the world is changing under us continuously. And we need the better basic education. This is a tool that's proved itself uh, elsewhere, been quite successful. I hear quite a bit of call for it. It's basically the same principle that's successful in the rest of the economy, competition. Uh, they're not, it's, we're not going to a private school system that depends on wealth. Uh, that was a red herring. Uh, we're sticking with the public school system and trying to improve it. And I think this is an essential part of the agenda. Uh, so, uh, we're trying to get something that works. And I think that means having a, an ability to appeal to somebody who's not got an interest. Chairman Paxton. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you know, I, I don't, for me, a study is not a way of killing the bill. For me, a study is a way of getting it right. But, and the way we kind of have it set up now, you know, and I'm not opposed to a, to a pilot program, which is kind of what we have when we're putting limitations on that, like we have put on. I, I don't want to stampede into this thing until we figure out what, if we're doing it right or not. I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to charter schools. You know, I, I think they have their place. And so, uh, 
you know, if we can, if we can open the door in some way to make it a little bit easier to, to start these things up uh, to, and, and use it as a pilot program so that we can look and see, you know, make sure that we're doing it right. I don't have a problem with that as long as we do, like I said before, maintain the same kind of standards. We're spending public money. We have to have the same kind of standards set for that for that charter school as we do for public schools, or or we 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 can't uh, you know walk away from it and say we you know we're changing any anything because of the the our our uh, um, need to to make sure that money is spent effectively and responsibly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I, again, I think, you know, if we stick with the statewide authorizer and our goal wasn't to create more government, we didn't want to set up a new separate commission, but a lot of other states, that's how they tackle this with having a statewide auth authorizer. Just building off of what um, Chairman Scott said, you know, this isn't a privatization. Um, it's still open to, to any, any child in the district. But, you know, if, if one concession we make is, you know, we still have two tracks. And that's what I like about how we brought it out of the Senate, because when we start just picking the school board as the authorizer, then we're starting to pick who the right appellate entity is. And then we're changing that structure that's right there in place for those charters that may want that. This would just be an option. And so, you know, the, the concession we've made is 85% ADM. Um, I think, again, if, if you'd be willing to go down this path of having this largely intact 130 as it came out of the Senate, but putting a four year sunset period and the PTSB oversight and then we can maybe go from there of, um, let's see, and maybe in this year we see an applicant, maybe we don't see any, and we adjust from there. And, you know, I just think we'll gain more information by having this out there because it is an optional program. And then maybe we see charters that come in under existing pr process through a school board. Um, but then I just think if we put that out there, I think we might, we might actually start getting some feedback and some applications. And if SLIB isn't right down the road, then adjust from there. But I think by making this change this year, it doesn't it doesn't mean that anything's going to change in the next fo this following year. I really don't see, um, you know, it's it's this conflicting information of oh, it's going to ruin Wyoming. Too many private for profit schools coming in. Then I hear well, but only less than half a dozen. You know, I don't hear people wanting to set up charters. So it is it, we've got to start putting something out there different. I think that will give us different information. And so by advancing this this year, I don't think that we're precluded down the road from making adjustments. But I think passing it this year, we might start seeing some interest and we might start seeing some more applications and then we can start reacting to that a little bit more. But, you know, I just think another year of study is just another year where our kids are missing out. And I'm, that's the, the lens I'm going to have. And I, I got to say, you know, there are my, I'm happy with my school district. My children are happy in their schools, but I do hear from parents who aren't happy and they want something different. Um, and so that's why I got I signed on to this bill. So. Would you be willing to keep the state, the SLIB as the statewide authorizer, have the PTSB oversight, and then do like a four year sunset? No. Not right now. I mean, I think once we study this, what came was a bill that was late, that was 30 some pages long, and it hasn't been studied by education in 10 years. It doesn't make sense to me. And, uh, and so I, you know, I think, you know, I think we provided a framework by which we can have a study and we limit it. And, uh, you know, that's, I mean, we can, we can adjourn for now and come back and visit later, but, you know, and then we can each visit on our sides, but. Uh, Representative Paxson, would you be willing to at least entertain the conversation of having the SLIB be this, uh, an alternative statewide authorizer PTSB oversight and like a four year sunset? Probably not. All righty. Um, I, I think my concern with the election is, you know, I've heard we don't want to have for profit big companies fly by night, I think, as they're described coming in. Um, but when I think about elections, they're expensive. And I don't know how small entities get a charter started on a different path with an election. I just think that's an expensive barrier. Um, so, Chairman Scott, do you have any thoughts? I think we're somewhat in an impasse, Chairman. Chairman, any other um, comments um, with our impasse? Senator Scott, um, do we just adjourn the meeting? And procedurally, I don't know where to go from here. I could use well, your assistance. Well, I think if, if we've thrown out quite a number of options, 
if y'all are willing to seriously considering any of these options were available, come come see us and we'll, we'll meet again. But if if you're not, well, then that's the way it is. Yeah, and I and and Miss and Madam Chairman, you know, we'll we'll go back and we'll take into account the county commission option and and uh, change in the. Uh, you know, and I, the other, you know, the other one, you know, we'll discuss is, you know, what about the state board, you know, as the, uh, as the other authorizer. So somebody that actually, you know, is invested in education. Um, we haven't talked about that, but I'm just throwing that idea out there. I think that's, they're so much part of the education establishment and have so much, many other duties for a volunteer, semi-volunteer board. Uh, I don't think that's a realistic option. Um, and then, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, th the offer remains, I think, as we talk about studying an interim, you know, if we don't get a product out of this session, I would highly encourage us to spend some time, you know, and I'll make it, make it as accommodating as possible, but to go visit some charter schools in other states. I just, I do think that as you tra people travel and they see what's out there, there's a sentiment that our families just don't have all the options if they're having difficulties with their, within their district. Uh, Representative Paxson. Madam Chairman, thank you. Um, you know, if, has anyone uh, from the Senate approached the county commissioners to see if they would be willing to take on that responsibility? Because I think that's probably another, another factor in our decision-making process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have not reached out to the County Commissioners Association. We wanted to see if there was any, um, after my, my walk down the hallway, I got a, a very strong sentiment that the majority floor leader didn't want to <laughs> have much conversation on this. So I didn't invest a ton of time in, in exploring some of those options beyond the research I did all weekend. Um, but Senator Driscoll's back to you. I think um, to recap, I think that there is not a lot of interest in advancing a bill, um, but they were willing to maybe have a conversation about allowing the county commissioners to be an authorizer. Madam Chairman. I do think we need to find something outside and I don't know how we do it right at this meeting, but I had visited with majority floor leader on the other side about this at length and I, I can live with it outside of the slip board. I think we can fix it going down the road, but I think we have a little disagreement on uh, once, a, once an application is correctly done and in place. The question is not an education question. That's back to the authorizers. The question is a fairness question. Did they treat the applicant fairly? That's not an education issue. The education issue is in the charter itself. When you read through the, the bill the way it's written, it's a contract. It's all written and it's a contract. It's the way it goes. And consequently, when you run into a situation that you're arbitrarily turned down by a local district, and there is an unwillingness of the existing education body to look outside of their realm. I think it's really important that someone fair does it. And to me, it's, you know, it can be binding arbitration. It can be using the Administrative Procedures Act, but someone has to decide whether the local school board acted fairly in denying the application. That doesn't say that that administrator plays a huge role in that end. What they merely say is, did they get treated fairly? And I don't think that the State Board of Education is the correct place. My visits with the superintendent was, she was comfortable with it going to the SLED board. That's why we went there. That was how we got to that point. Uh, my end is, like I say, is I think there's some confusion about as far as the authorizers having to be wildly good at education. Really what they do is they authorize that other board to go in place. And the board then is, is accountable to the contract. And that's really what it is. It's a bifurcated contract. It's two levels. One's the application. The other one, as you go into the guts of it, is what they agree that they're going to do when they teach. With it, that end will be done with the State Board of Education and whatnot. That's not done on their own. So the authorizers to me is 
I'm not crazy either way. I'll, I'll live with it. Uh, I think that the other two members of this committee are priced out or I am on it as far as where they're at. But I do think you've got to have it where if someone's going to go through the effort to put together a group of parents or a charter school group comes and helps them, they need to know that they've got a fair hearing. Why bother putting the application together if you're going to be told no? You're going to walk out in front of a group of people and they're going to say no to you before you start? Why apply? And, and that's the whole point of it to me is make sure that they don't unfairly get turned down. And that's, that's what we've got to try to do here today is who is the best arbiter of that? And Mr. Majority Floor Leader, I look you in the eye because you keep saying, well, they've got to be an education person. And I'm like, no, they got to be a judge. They've got to sit down and look and say, did they get treated fairly? And if they did, they're stuck. If they didn't get treated fairly, that's when the other part of this bill kicks in and says, look, they've now got the ability to form their own board and work independently because it's obvious that this local school board's not going to deal in good faith with them. And that's what the authorizer does. Or that's the way I see it. You know, and, and the way, obviously, you know, the way the bill's crafted now <clears throat> is it is the authorizer is the superintendent, but it's a vote of the people. If it's wanted in that area, the people will support it. It's that simple. But we'll, uh, we'll listen, you know, to, you know, we, the reason we threw out state board is options, right? You were throwing out county commission. I just threw out the idea about the state board. So um, we'll take uh, your stuff under advisement and come back. But, you know, I think, I don't know. It's just kind of where we're at, I think. Um, you know, along those lines, you know, we, again, we're just going to keep hammering options. PTSB, who the authorizer is for your sunset, keep the 85% ADM. But along those lines, if it's the county commission or even the state board of education is what's the standard of review. And I, I feel very much strongly to majority floor leaders point about, um, arbitrary and capricious decision-making for any governmental entity. That's, that's always going to be a concern for me. And so it is, if we, we're go to go down the path of the State Board of Education or county commissioners, the reviewer, the, the appellate level is probably OAH or something that has a, a clear legal standard that's defined because right now the, um, an undefined term, like when you read that law, I, I don't know how anyone would wanna apply for a charter school when you don't have a clear understanding of um, what discretion the school board in saying no is. They could say, well, we don't, we don't like the color of your shirt. I mean, that's how arbitrary our standard is right now in the law. And that's that's always going to be a problem for me. But um, we appreciate you considering that. So just as make sure you have, fold that into your conversations is how a, a person would be a, appealing if they were denied. Um, and majority floor leader Driscoll. Real quick, we're about to go and I kind of see where we're heading, but I'd like to turn it back just a little bit for you folks to look inward and give me your thoughts. What's the big disaster if we do it with the slip board? What, what is going to be the absolute disaster if you stuck with the slip board and pretty much looked at this bill as it came out of the Senate? Where's the disaster at? Is, is, this, going to, is this going to irreparably harm K-12 education? Is it, uh, what, what's it really going to do? What's the real threats? And what's the possible outcomes good or bad, if we actually start a couple charter schools in Wyoming and go down that path. I guess, you know, to me is, I'm seeing a boogeyman around every corner and a lot of black helicopters. And we've got some here and they're working. And I, for the life of me, can't see this ultimate disaster that we've destroyed our K-12 system because we allowed someone to have choice of where their kids went to school. And I, I just don't see it. It actually does it at a cheaper rate and it gives parents and kids options. And I just can't see the black helicopters. I've been there from the start is uh, really, even if it, it went crazy and someone comes in, I, I just don't see it being a threat to K-12. What I see it is an enhancement to K-12 as it is now. And I think it makes our local communities think as well as 
we've had a intense interest in education at the same time we've had an intense loss of precipitation. Parents just don't care anymore. You know what parents of charter school kids do? They care. And that's any time you can make parents care, we've gained. Any time we can have happy teachers, we've gained. Any time we can get kids to have skills that work in their communities and do it in any fashion we can do it and get them through school, we've gained. And that's my question to you is why? Why are we making it impossible to do it? If the horse runs, we can slow him down. We can sit here next year and say, oh, we need to slow up. We've got five applications in. It's a major threat to our K-12 system. We can say time out. We've got the ability to do that. They're not going to happen overnight. Mr. Mr. Chairman, yeah. let me follow up on that from, from personal experience. We went to a system of choice schools in the Toronto County, and we had some notable successes. Uh, the uh, Casper Classical Academy, uh, the, the Wood School of Choice, all of them, they worked very well. Uh, but not all the ones that were tried worked very well. My son was in one that uh, had a particular structure and the, the teachers involved had put it together and it, it proved not to work very well. And what happened was at the end of the semester, the parents all voted with their feet and the children went back to the public school and no great harm was done. Uh, he went on, spent a year in, in, in Speaker Harshman's, former Speaker Harshman's football program, which was good for him, uh, and then went on from that. Uh, it, the price of experimenting is sometimes you get one that doesn't work, but you know, it, as uh, Senator Driscoll said, the, what's the downside? I've seen the downside and it really wasn't all that bad. We were able to remedy it quite rapidly uh, and that's what would happen. So, you know, they've got to, they've got to compete successfully. And with our choice system in Casper, some of them did and some of them didn't. And the ones that didn't, well, it came to an abrupt end uh, and the kids were fine. The kids were surprisingly resilient, but a lot of the ones that have gone through this, the ones that have been successful have been getting a better education than they would have otherwise. Because with the, the choice you were able to match the, the school and its instruction method with the kids. So um, I think you've got to look at it that way too. And Mr. Chairman, just one final comment about the election. I, I suspect an election in Pinedale is a lot different than an election in Cheyenne. I mean, that's the heart, that's the heartburn I have is um, I can see in a small town where an election getting on the ballot, um, you know, there's a very charming, I, I, I understand that. Um, I don't know that my community is small like that elections in this town, I suspect this would get really political, really expensive. Um, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. 